Uh, do we want to hop into our integration discussion here? I think today we're going to talk about Camboard. I think I, I saw our overview and I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to dive right in here. You know, Camboard uh, is, is near and dear to my heart. I'm going to go over the introduction as well as the overview of, of Camboard that I wrote up. And we are going to, to run through the documentation and see if there's any improvements we can make here. So to start off in the overview... Uh, I would say that the Canboard software is meant to track what tasks are in which state. A good introduction can be found at the Canboard project's official documentation site. So if you would indulge me, I will actually hop over there uh, for a few and, and go through that so we can have at least a baseline of what we're talking about here. So on their documentation, on their user's guide, they, they ask the question, what is Kanban, right? So Kanban, the answer, is a methodology originally developed by Toyota to be more efficient. There are only two constraints imposed by Kanban. One is to visualize your workflow and the other to limit your work in progress. To dive into the first part there to visualize your workflow, uh, your work is displayed on a board so that you have a clear overview of your project. And it's a board with rows and columns and, and we have uh, tasks indicated by think of little sticky notes, little post-it notes. Um, and those are moved around the board to indicate different things. And we'll dive into those in a second. Uh, each column represents a step in your workflow. And typically the workflow is meant to flow from the leftmost side of the board to the, the rightmost side of the board. So once it reaches the last column, uh, that would indicate typically a, a done status of a task. Um, now, the, the other constraint that Kanban implements here is to limit your work in progress. Uh, so that encourages focus by avoiding multitasking. We want to make sure we're working on the things we're working on. Uh, each phase, each column here can have work in progress limits. Uh, and by doing so, it helps to identify bottlenecks and avoid working on too many tasks at the same time. But how do we measure performance, right? So... So Kanban has two kind of key indicators. Uh, they use the lead time, which would be the time between the task creation and the task completion, and the cycle time, which is the time between the task start and the task completion. Now, that may seem similar, but let's, let's break it down. If I have a client come to me and ask me how long it's going to take to do a task, if I know that my lead time on average for a, a small task, if they're asking me to do a small task, I know on average from the time I put a task on my board to the time it ends that it's two weeks, I can tell them, hey, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be two weeks. And then they can go off and, and I can be confident in giving them an honest answer uh, to, to estimate how long it's going to get them to get a product, right? The cycle time, however, would be the time that I'm actually working on it, right? So... I have a life, you know, I have responsibilities out here and I have other projects that I'm working on at the same time. So I can only dedicate a certain amount of that two weeks to the specific project that I am doing for that client. The time when I actually start that task and the time that I complete that task is called the cycle time. That's, that's how long it's actually taking me to work that task, where the lead time is from the time that I accept the project to the time that the project is completed. And they feed off each other too, right? And you get a constant feedback loop of how my cycle time influences my lead time and how good my estimations are. If I'm overestimating cycle time, then my lead time start cutting down. Uh, and, and it's just a, a good balancing act right there. It is... It's very beneficial to have a system that tracks those so that we can see if we're getting better or worse or, or how we're doing just internally uh, among ourselves. So, uh, and we, we use that because we're able to do those measurements, right? But we also do that because we've also considered the alternatives, right? And Kanboard's documentation has a very good breakdown here. So if we take a look at Kanban versus to-do lists, right? To-do lists... It, well, everyone knows what a to-do list is. It's a list. It's one single list of things you have to do. Now, that's simplifying it. There are uh, systems like the Getting Things Done system or What's Best Next that use multiple lists in different ways, right? But ultimately, a list is a list is a list. And it is 
little bit more inflexible than I think I'm comfortable with, right? As well, it opens up the door to multitasking, especially if I have a list staring at me in the face and I have all the tasks, say it's a weekly list, right? I'm looking at everything I got to get done for a week. That is a lot of things that can quickly become overwhelming, or I could be tempted to take it all on at one point, which is going to be equally as devastating to my productivity. So Kanban avoids doing that by breaking these tasks up into multiple phases in in the columns and saying that, all right, if I've got three tasks in one step and, and two of them are are advanced to the next step, right? I can focus on exactly what I want to at any given time, right? It brings that focus to avoid the multitasking, right? By setting that that limit per column. It's one, more flexible, and, it, and it's easier to maintain focus using a Kanban system. Almost on the other side of the spectrum is the Scrum methodology. Now, It doesn't use lists as much as it uses a board as well, right? So they are similar in that respect. However, the processes around them are different. Uh, For example, Scrum has the concept of sprints, which are time box units, usually about two or four weeks, uh, in which every task on the board has to be completed, it doesn't allow for the flexibility, I think, that, that Kanban does, and it doesn't yeah. allow for the flow. If, if you think about it, what is my analogous representation in the physical world? A, a whiteboard, say, right? If I have sure. a whiteboard with post-it notes on it, I know I move stuff from left to right in, in a board-type system. That's, that's a given. Now, what I don't do is every two weeks erase the board entirely and recreate it from scratch. Right. That just doesn't make any sense to me. I could I could see the potential benefits of, of reanalyzing the situation, sure, but it does not make sense to me to only wipe down that entire board every two weeks and then reprioritize everything. It has more specific uh, leadership guidelines where there are predefined roles like Scrum Master and Product Owners and then the rest of the team, where Kanban, on the other hand, is, is a more continuous flow where changes are... are fairly easy to make i think kind of hopping in uh basically with scrum i i kind of see what we do at our compose is kind of like a hybrid between scrum and kanban leaning a lot more towards kanban than scrum i mean we do have priority meetings and retrospective meetings um but with that we're able to prioritize we're, we're flexible i think is the big difference between scrum and kanban i, I think the difference at least for us, is the flexibility. We're not held absolutely accountable for Scrum or our two-week or four-week period for wiping everything off the board and literally starting brand, brand new and fresh every two or four weeks. We can have outstanding items out there. And having gone over those systems in relation to Kanban, it is a spectrum. Uh, there is the loose-leaf to-do list scattered all over the office kind of situation and then you have the scrum board where no one is allowed to add anything without about three or four meetings of discussion and right? a- approval from a man and right, approvals right, and right. exactly yeah, yeah. so so it, within that spectrum lies i think kanban uh, and it's just always been a happy medium for me uh, and i think it's flexible enough to to deal with the situations that we find ourselves uh, coming up in now i did want to touch on a couple things that I thought I would have liked to know when I started using Kanban. Sure. I want to, let's hear them. Uh, so besides the Kanban official introduction, uh, there were a couple things to point on. So several key indicators in Kanban that it presents to the user when you're creating new tasks or when you're reviewing existing tasks um, are as follows. So one is the assignee, which is the person who is responsible for taking action on the task as it stands right now. Uh, and that can also be changed over the life cycle of a task. If, uh, if we have a state where, well, we do have a state, Jack and I, uh, a review column. And when that, when a task gets put into that review column, if that's something that I need Jack to review, I will absolutely assign it to him, even though I did all the work. At that point in the life cycle of the task, it is on his shoulders to complete the work that needs to be accomplished. 
to review, right, right? Yeah, so at that point, he is the assignee. He is the person who is responsible for taking action on that task, right? Uh, and next is the state, which is whether this task needs to be worked on, reviewed, or followed up on. So like I said before, I mean, we have a review state. We also have a waiting state. We have a planning state. So there are a couple that we utilize. I'm actually going to dive into that in our next episode, so stay tuned. Uh, next is our description. So this is probably the most important and most underutilized field when you're creating a task. And I think it really comes down to three things. I wrote here that this is the initial rationale or reason for a task to be done. This should describe the desired outcome as well as a high level outline of what it might take to get there. So, so there are your three points, right? So there's the why, the reason or the problem that you encountered, uh, the end state or what determines when it's done. Like what is, right. what is the done condition? Taking a step back and saying, all right, what is this actually going to be to done? When, when is this actually going to be done? And what is outside of the scope of this that needs to be categorized as a, a explicit something else? Right. Right. Uh, and then the last part of it is just a high level outline of what it might take to get there. So it is important that that I just don't dump something in Jack's lap and say, hey, I got a task for you to uh, to fix this. And he's like, I don't even know where you want me to start looking. Right. So so giving giving an initial boost there, even if it's for myself, just to jot down some notes for myself, what I think I might want to start researching first or or how I might go about this is going to be beneficial. Uh, and then the last key indicator I would say is the due date. So it's it's a date field like any other date field for a task. Uh, typically, it's used to indicate that a task needs to be completed by set date or that an event related to that task will be occurring on a set date. Now, I use it in, in that manner, which is a little bit more fluid than what a due date actually is. Um, typically, I use it to say, hey, I'm helping my buddy move uh, on Saturday. So that's the due date for that task. Now, I also set the due date for the show notes that Jack and I produce for this show. Right. That right. is an actual due date and says you need to have this completed by that date, not that the event of moving will be on that due date. Maybe if it becomes an issue, Camboard also has a start date field. So if there is something that needs to be started before it's due, that field could be utilized as well if you want to get a little bit more granular. Up front, I just want to keep it simple. I'm just using due date and it's been working out just fine for me. Now, there are several other optional fields that can provide valuable information on a given task. Uh, one is a priority, and we actually use this in conjunction with swim lanes uh, or the, the rows of the board. This is basically how urgent it is that the task gets done. I'd call it criticality. What's the criticality of the task? So along with criticality, right, comes complexity. So, so we know how quickly we need to address this, but how long and how much effort is it going to take to address this? Uh, so this, this complexity, or, or some people use it as a, just a straight up time estimate, it provides an upfront way to show how much work will be required to complete the task. Now, this is something I'll be going into a little bit more in depth next week, how we uh, complexitize our tasks and, and determine how we rate those and, and categorize those. Um, but it is something that's a little bit more touchy-feely than, say, a date. It's a little more arbitrary. Uh, and the last one here is category. So this is a good way to indicate that this task is part of a bigger project or linked to other tasks somehow in a logical grouping. Um, typically, if I have a big task to complete, I'm going to I'm going to create it more as a as a category and then break different tasks out and and associate them with that category so that when the when all the tasks are done, I can consider that overarching project done as well. Most of those are going to have separate pages in the Canboard book that we maintain at Bookstack, uh, which is compositionalenterprises.rcompose.com slash Bookstack. And we will be updating that as we go through this Canboard series. Uh, but I did want to touch on two more things here uh, relevant to Canboard. Once again, things I wish I knew when I started. Uh, one of them being board scope. How do we determine which board to use, right? So if, if you think of it, going back to our analogy in the real world, if I have a whiteboard, right, my temptation is just to use one giant massive board for everything. Fortunately or unfortunately, 
Camboard offers us the ability to create a near infinite amount of boards. So we have to figure out what is the happy medium between one giant board for everything and a bunch of little happy boards for everything. I've come up with three questions that I ask myself every time that I come up with a new widget that we want to, to create. And does it go on this board or do we need a new board for it? So uh, question number one is, does the same workflow apply? Uh, question number two, are the same group of people going to use this board? And number three, is the same visibility needed? Does it need to be public rather than private or private rather than public? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then a new board should be created for the project under consideration. Otherwise, there is no reason to not continue to use the same board. Uh, it, it becomes overwhelming very quick uh, to have to context switch between boards. And as well, it loses one of the, the key tenets of a Kanban system, right? which is to visualize your workflow. If you're not right. able to visualize it in a single pane of glass or, or by looking at one or at, at max two different boards, right, then you've already lost your productive edge. Keeping it as tight as possible is going to maintain that benefit for you and just ultimately create a more cohesive experience. If you have the thought in your head that something you're going to do is going to need a new board, that you're going to create a new board to do some kind of grand experiment, uh, then I would ask yourself, does the same workflow apply? Are the same group of people going to use the board? And is the same visibility needed? I really like it. Right now, I think uh, just kind of a quick riff off that. We have our one board right now for software development. And I think in the near future is what I'll say is we're going to we're going to create a second one here for kind of our sales and uh, customer relationship. Yeah, definitely good questions to ask before deciding whether or not to go with a new board or staying with the existing one. Absolutely. Uh, and then the last thing here, we've kind of been tiptoeing around, but I wanted to kind of explicitly state what our workflow is or, or what the basic workflow is. So uh, there are two things. There are columns and rows in, in our board here. So we would call the columns, we would call them states of the task, but the, what is the state of the task? Now, the basic workflow consists of several columns to indicate the state of the task. Typically, a task is moved from the leftmost column to the rightmost column, like we were talking about earlier, as it progresses through the states. The most basic setup consists of three states, to do, doing, and done. This can be expanded, renamed, and altogether mangled based on the project requirements. Yeah. I think we're going to get a little bit into that next week. I'm, I'm hoping so, at least. Our next week's chat is going to be around the initial configuration. Uh, so we are absolutely going to get into what board am I going to create? Like, what is my workflow going to be? We're going to go over if I need to, you know, if, if I need to put together a software development workflow, what is that going to look like? If I need to put together a management workflow or sales pipeline, what is that going to look yeah. like? Uh, and... And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to, to dive into that in, in great awesome. detail. Me there too. Too. Me too. Me too. Uh, now, the, the next aspect of the, the workflow would be the rows, or, or as we call them, the swim lanes. So these are the horizontal rows in which tasks can be categorized. A good rule of thumb is that tasks that are put into swim lanes on top are in some way more important than tasks that are put into lower swim lanes. While these are not strictly necessary, a basic board should start with at least two swim lanes. One being the critical swim lane, and the other being the everything else swim lane. This serves to highlight the old adage that if everything is critical, then nothing is critical, and forces the users to a modicum of prioritization right from the start. Having those two blocks, uh, once once those are well thought through and architected and implemented, uh, you are well on your way to to a solid uh, tool to to help you with your your workflow. Yeah, as a kind of one line summary, it's task management. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, anything else to add? Yeah, Andrew, let's hear uh, if you had uh, any final words, any conclusion, any quick conclusion you'd have to give on uh, Camboard anything that you think that anyone should absolutely know what do you think it'd be since you prop that door wide open 
<laughs> I'm going to finish up with kind of usage examples. Now, one, obviously, software development, as we're using it right now, um, it gets us a, a good indication of when something's ready to be deployed, uh, what each of us is responsible for, and what we can expect to be done uh, within a reasonable amount of time. The next one is, is bug tracking. Still in the software development realm, uh, but tracking issues or following up on projects that are having some, some problems and, and need to get done. Uh, sales is another good example that I've seen used a lot dealing with leads, meetings, different proposals and purchases uh, that are all part of that sales pipeline can be tracked through a uh, Kanban board. Um, business management as well, tracking ideas and doing measurement and analysis of, of these these business proposals, how, how they work out in the real world is very well highlighted in a Kanban software type model. Uh, same goes for the recruiting process, uh, online shops with orders, packaging, shipping, and even manufacturing, you know, to, to loop it back to where it all started. This framework really can accommodate a lot of different workflows. Uh, I think the single pane of glass and the focus that it brings is very beneficial to, to any type of productivity that you're trying to eke out of yourself or others.